Hey everyone, this amazing ESO Network show is brought to you by our fine sponsor, Amazon.com. Please remember to shop Amazon for all your geeky needs, no matter what time of the year it is. All you need to do is go to ESOPodcast.com slash ESO Amazon, or click on the Amazon banner on the ESO Network webpage to go to our e-store. It's the best way to shop and the best way to support this program, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Okay, that's enough of me babbling for now. Now on with your regular scheduled show. I'm Drew Leiter. And I'm Cleus Jacobs. We're here to tell you about our podcast, The Earth Station DCU. Join us every week as we discuss the DC Universe. We talk everything DC, including comics, television, the cinematic universe, and so much more. We look forward to bringing you some great reviews and discussions. And don't forget, read, read more, more comics. comics. Hello and welcome again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show Podcast. I am your host, The Monster, back to give you some sci-fi news for this week. Now, I talked about not doing possibly another podcast before Thanksgiving since the last one was about the U.S. election results and about my feelings on Trump. Honestly, I didn't feel really engaged to do another podcast, but... This week, there's a lot of cool information that I thought, you know what, I need to do this just to kind of get my head straight again, because this is what I love for. I love getting information about all things geeky and just kind of like nerd out on it. So I really packed a lot of information in here. So please do me a favor and listen to me nerd out. So, let's start off with a couple of side notes, because I have the big, the normal big three topics, which I'll get to, but I have some couple of side notes that I want to talk first, and then after I talk about the big three, I still have even more stuff to talk about. So, this is really going to be, hopefully, something manageable within a 30-minute time frame. Fingers crossed. All right. So, the, the first side note that I came across was that Parker Posey is going to be playing Dr. Smith on the uh, remake or the reboot, whatever you want to call it, for the Lost in Space series that Netflix is going to produce. Um, I really love watching Parker. The The first time that I actually felt really a good attraction to her, even though it was a crappy movie, was the Superman Returns movie with Brandon Routh, which Brian Singer directed. She to me, really played it well, playing the mall to Lex Luthor. And there was another uh, performance that she gave that was standing out for me that's still haunting. Um, she played in the series Louis C.K. She played the girlfriend for Louis C.K. in season three, episode four and five. It's called Daddy's Girlfriend, parts one and two. The second part of that episode, if you haven't watched... Louis, that to me the the big um, climax uh, is having her performance, being on top of a rooftop, and really dishing out some really cool stuff. But in the background, the music is what is is, is extraordinary. There is a song that is played um, by Duke Pearson, I believe, um, and it's called Cristo Redento, which is Christ the Redeemer. But listening to that music and seeing her performance, it was just so wonderful. So it's endearing to see her back again and into a series that, for the most part, when it first aired, didn't really care for (laughs) Lost in Space. I loved the movie. And there was a remake or another pilot that CBS tried to do that didn't really go anywhere. But it was interesting. So I'll talk about that later on when we do get more information about what's going to happen with Lost in Space. So the other bit of casting news. Angela Bassett is now heading towards Marvel's Black Panther. 
So talk about a stellar cast. I mean, I'm really happy that this is all happening. And honestly, I don't want to hear any crap from people saying, well, there's not enough white people in Black Panther. You know, that's really upsetting to hear because people were saying that, you know, there's not enough white people in Luke Cage. Well, there's not enough white people in Harlem either, but you don't hear me complaining about that. But having her join um, is going to really up the game for Marvel. So, again, really happy that's happening. And then we have uh, Amelia Clark, who, if you know, the mother of all dragons, is from Game of Thrones. She is now going to be in the Han Solo, Solo Star Wars movie. Um, there's no uh, idea as to what role she will be playing. She will be playing against uh, Donald Glover, who's playing Lando Calrissian, and Alden Ironreich. Oh, I'm sorry for mispronouncing that, but he's going to be playing Han Solo. So, all in all, really happy about that. Oh, Jesus. Hold on. <clears throat> sorry about that. I have a couple of cats that we kind of take care of in the neighborhood. Got into a little bit of a hullabaloo with each other. Uh, because we let them into the house every once in a while. And for the most part, they behave. But every once in a while, I have to kind of throw them back out to teach them a lesson. So, sorry again, sorry about that. So, yesterday, at the time of this recording, Rocky turns 40 years old. So, I am older than Rocky. Yeah. <laughs> but... I had been watching Creed on Hulu just the other day, finally getting around to see that. And, of course, Michael B. Jordan gave a really good performance as Adonis Creed, who is also going to be in the Black Panther movie. So that's also a plus why I wanted to see this. So having seen uh, this movie and having watched Rocky so many times and all the other sequels, it wasn't a bad movie. I'm glad it ended the way it did. I was just kind of expecting to have more of an emotional connection, much like you did when you watched Rocky the first time. It really didn't have the same impact, but nonetheless, I was still entertained. So that's really the heart of it, is that if you enjoy this, and I hope they do continue with the Creed series, that will be really kind of awesome to go forward from that. All right, so... What are my big three topics that I'm going to be talking about? Well, we have an EM drive, the improbable drive that is now probable. So we're going to be heading to Mars, hopefully, with that. We have legendary pictures are getting the rights back to do Dune, which is awesome. And lastly... We may be getting some nudity and swearing on Star Trek Discovery, or as I call it, STD. So, be prepared. There will be some swearing on this podcast when I get to that part. Alright, so let's get back to the EM drive, which is really an electric mag- electromagnetic drive, referred to as the impro- improbable drive. Sorry, I had to uh, get these jokes out. I was going to talk about, well, what is the law of of motion, which is Newton's three laws of motion. I was going to say, what is the law? And do a whole island of Dr. Moreau thing, and I'm like, ah, screw it. So, basically, if you're not familiar, the three laws, the first one being says an object at, at rest remains at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion unless there's an outside force acting upon it. That's the first one. Then we have the force of an object equals to the rate of change in this momentum over time. And then lastly, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So, what the hell did I bring up that for? There's a reason about this improbable drive. The fact that it's an engine that does not use propellant it does not expel any fuel but yet it still moves 
I want to say it's more like having a warp bubble like you would see on Star Trek and, and the Enterprise ships or any of the ships using a warp technology. Not to that degree, but what's interesting is that there is no... Um, it's a self-contained unit. And basically with the radiation and the microwaves working together and pushed in a certain direction, it pushes pushes the ship. But like it says, you know, forever action and there's an equal and opposite reaction. Well, in order for a rocket to sail or go through space in a vacuum because there is no energy there, it has to shoot out the fuel in order for that rocket to go forward. Well, if it doesn't do that, it kind of breaks the laws of motion. So that's what's really interesting. So when you boil it all down, what the hell does that mean? Well, according to the article that I was reading, is that we can go to the moon in just four hours, which is, in our case, from Miami to Orlando. Four-hour drive. We can do that. Now we can go to the moon. We can go to Mars in 70 days. So that's a month, that's two months and 10 days, instead of having six months in space. And, of course, if you want to go to Pluto, it'll just take 18 months. So talk about having something that's revolutionary and exciting. And considering there is a push to have, not the space mission to go to the moon, but now to go to Mars. And hopefully within our lifetime, we can actually get to have people on the moon. Not just men. People. Men and women on the moon, uh, on Mars. So, um, I have been watching a series on Hulu, which is called Mars, oddly enough. In which it belongs on a, on a National Geographic channel. Now, I already saw the first episode, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to wait until the series is over. And I think it's on like 10 episodes. And when the last episode airs, then Hulu gets to show the whole entire series. But what's interesting is that it's taking place in the future. And, and it has a crew that's on its way to Mars. And they go through whatever scenarios or whatever things happen during a mission and what they expected. And they cut to present day situation in which they're talking to real um, scientists and other people were, were um, connected to the mission to Mars and what they're going to have to overcome in order for that to happen. Now, of course, this EM drive, which has been out since, I think, well, the, the person who came up with the theory was doing it in the late 1990s. And the paper was written and so forth. But just recently, it was peer-reviewed, meaning that all the, I guess, experiments and sound uh, observations are really good. But they still have to then now produce this and see if they're able to make this happen. So there were no flaws that the peer review found in the paper for the EM drive. Now they have to now take the next step and build an actual thing. So, that's going to be interesting. And I'm really going to be excited that if this does happen, my God, what an exciting time that will be. Something to really look forward to. And beyond the four years that we had to deal with Trump. Just saying. All right. So... Let's move on to part two, which is legendary pictures is getting, or actually legendary entertainment is getting back to rights for Dune. Um, I've mentioned Dune before in this podcast. Dune is the only book that I've read several times more than any other book. And let me clarify, it's the only book I've read more than once. And... I really didn't get Dune at all when it first came out, but my friend Brian, who I, was a, a childhood friend, uh, saw the movie and says, you know what, it's a mess, but this is the kind of movie that you would like. And I did like it. And this is way back in uh, 19... Oh, I'm blanking out here. 1983, 84. 
Uh, David Lynch directed Dune. And I I starred Kyle MacLachlan, who is going to be in Twin Peaks, which I'm going to be talking about that coming next year because I'm really excited about the return of Twin Peaks. But what I loved about the series is that it was very bizarre. And basically, if you love David Lynch's work, it's kind of keeping in with a lot of tones and a lot of motifs that he does throughout his movies. But it was just completely different. It was more space opera-ish. And for the longest part, the longest time, pardon, the longest time I should say, I watched the movie over and over again, and then the Sci-Fi Channel aired it, but it did a four-hour version of it. So basically, they added in a lot more scenes, a lot more exposition, and it kind of fleshed things out. So having seen that, I felt this is a little bit more um, fulfilling. Then I started reading the book, and I'm like, oh, I can really see, you know how this is such a task to try to portray that world in a two-hour movie that was next to impossible. There's no way that could have been done. Now, given that there was a four-hour version, great. I give him kudos for at least trying. It's a hard subject to really put into just two hours. So, from 2000... Sci-Fi Channel does it as a miniseries with William Hurt. Fantastic. That's the way it should have been done since the beginning. But again, that kind of stuff never happened. You know, Game of Thrones is only just recent. Um, we also have possibility that Stranger in, uh, A Stranger in a Strange Land, Robert Highland's book, is going to be coming out as a movie or the uh, property as a TV, TV series. I'm not sure. But... All these great sci-fi books are finally being adapted to be presented the way it can be because now we have the technology, we have the venue, and we can stream stuff that we don't have to cram everything in just two movies or two hours in a movie, but expand that. And we have Netflix who can really hold that property well together because we've seen properties like Marvel with Daredevil and, and, and Jessica Jones and Luke Cage. You can do series like that. HBO has Game of Thrones and has Westworld. So now is the time to kind of get back into what makes Dune really amazing. Now, I've done, um, like I said, I've I've reread the book several times. Um, I even had a Dune book group back in 2008. Um, in which I posted articles from uh, a couple of people that were joining me in this book group. And then just recently, maybe about two or three years ago, I led a book group talk at my, not my library, but a library that I hosted for them. So it's a very well, um, what's the right word? It's a book that you really need to start with. If there was going to be a sci-fi introduction and you don't have any point of reference, you don't know what Star Wars is or Star Trek or any other kind of sci-fi properties, this is the movie, this is the book to me that you would need to start on this universe to expand your horizons and, and look at it as the fantasy version of The Lord of the Rings. It is that epic and it's that grand scale storytelling. And really, you really have to just start there. Granted, you know, again, Star Wars is fantastic, but that's what you really need to be at. Um, there was a documentary, and I'm going to mispronounce this guy's name, George Orwaski. I'm sorry about that. But he also had, I think, way back in the 70s, if not late 60s or 70s, planned to do the Dune movie. And he had um, wanted to cast Mick Jagger in it. Pablo Picasso was going to be in this. And I'm like, no, no, not Picasso. Sorry, Dolly. Dolly was going to be in it. And if you get a chance, watch that documentary after you've seen the movie, the miniseries, you write the book, then you can appreciate what he was trying to do. So 
it, it's a great series to get into. And I've only read up to the third book. And then I think there's four or five in that series that Frank Herbert had written. And when he had passed years later, um, his son and Kevin Anderson, if I'm remembering correctly, found notes and outlines for even more Dune series. So they have books that are taking place between books and it's expanded the whole universe even beyond what I can even imagine. So eventually, I would love to read the entire series. But my God, is this world really dense. So I'm interested to see what they can do for a movie. I'm more interested in what they could do for a TV series. Because honestly, you can do maybe a season per book. And really change up the way you can tell stories. So you already do that already with Game of Thrones. There's no reason why you can't do that with Doom. So have I said enough about Doom? No. But we do. Alright, so the last on my list is the nudity and the swearing part for Star Trek Discovery. So... There's Goram, there's Frel, Smurf, Poodoo, Frag, Shazbot, and Frack. So these are some very famous sci-fi curse words that if you're familiar with them, you know where they belong in the sci-fi universe of that genre. Now, having said that, Star Trek has cursed before. Um... Picard does. He says, again, from this point on, if you have any small children, I'm going to be cursing so and saying a lot of adult stuff, so don't have them listen to it. Just say, go have some money, go play in traffic. Okay. Um, Picard does curse, in French, the word shit. And Data also curses, saying, oh shit, In Generations, as the Enterprise is crashing onto a planet. So, that's not a big deal, right? No. They can say shit. They can say crap. I wouldn't mind if the language is a little more uh, adult in that way. But again, Star Trek, for the most part, was on television. And a lot of their movies were PG, PG PG-13. They really didn't push the envelope with either regarding nudity or basically the cursing because it's that's not what Star Trek was about and it didn't have to rely on that but um, on Facebook uh, my friend Tony had mentioned this and I wanted to bring this up and I also have a counterpoint to that uh, by the name of Chris so Tony wrote that they got to grow up and become a t- t- the 21st century series That means they should look a lot like AMC, FX, HBO, and Netflix shows. So yeah, profanity, nudity, nudity, a movie star, they're on the right track. Uh, Make it serialized and a shorter series, and they'll be really on point. Um, The point of the movie star is that he mentioned that uh, Michelle Yao Yao, uh, is going to be on the Star Trek series. So Michelle Yao is going to be having an STD career (laughs) she's playing the role of gonorrhea (laughs) so I still don't know what role she'll be playing I don't know she'll be the captain first officer who knows but that's one that we have in the bag now Chris on the other hand wrote I'm all for the grittier and more premium production and that could include sex and death and angst but personally not sure if I need my Star Trek to have nudity or significant cursing. Mad Men had no nudity and no F-bombs and it was still a great show. Uh, same with BSG, although there is some partial nudity. Not stuff that you would normally see um, or get away with on normal TV. Um, Star Trek Discovery should follow that model rather than Westworld where people just say fuck and repeatedly and justify being on HBO. 
I agree. So, taking both points and, and throwing my two cents into this, when I saw Spartacus, the the remake or the or the series, Lucy Lawless, who played Xena, was on this series and played a character named Lucretia. Lucy was nude a lot. I mean, to the point that I mean, look, I'm hot for her to begin with. So seeing her nude, that was icing on the cake. But I got to the point, I'm like telling my co-host Gene, you know what? I'm done. I don't need to see <laughs> Lucy's tits anymore. I'm sorry if I'm cursing. I don't need to see them anymore. I've seen them all. I've I've got more than my fill. So, okay. That's it. But it was, after all, it was just like, enough. I don't want... Star Trek Discovery to be that. That's my thing. Do the nudity for reasons that make sense to the story. Not gratuitous. If you're going to curse, fine, curse. But again, be smart about this. Um, Honestly, if you're relying on these markers to kind of push your series to the forefront of all these other series that are on right now, like Game of Thrones and and Westworld, which have a great deal of nudity and a great deal of of violence, then you've lost sight of Roddenberry's vision. I don't think they're going to do that, but that's always going to be a concern. So, we'll see what happens. And again, I don't want to see things or hear things just for the sake of it but you know that's what happens all right so that was my big three topics that i'm going to be talking about and i already did my side notes so on a side note or a post note on the podcast um there was an article that talked about um the Star Trek fan film says the CBS and Paramount don't own the idea of Star Trek. And I posted it to my Facebook page and I talked about how I think I had an option to kind of make this work for both parties. But uh, there was a person on Twitter that commented and I want to respond to that. Um, so let me start off with this. Because not a whole lot of people understand the idea about copyright or fair use. So I wanted to talk about that in in context with the article and then give my two cents about that to answer um, this response. So basically, what is copyright? So copyright refers to the authors, the creators of all such of sorts, such as the writers, the photographers, artists, film producers, composers, programmers, exclusive right to reproduce, prepare derivative works, distribute copies, and publicly perform and display their works. These rights may be transferred or assigned in whole or in part in writing by the author, unless otherwise agreed in writing, work created by an employee is usually owned by the employer. So, in this case, um, I'm getting this from the Library of Congress. When Roddenberry created Star Trek, while he may be the creator, CBS owned, and Paramount later on owned the rights to that series. So, what is fair use? Well, fair use is an exception to the exclusive protection of copyright under the American law. It permits certain limits uses without permission from the author or owner, depending on the circumstance. Copying may be considered fair for the purpose of criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, including multiple copies for classroom use, and scholar or research. So, when it says here, to determine whether a specific use under one of these categories is fair, courts are to consider the following factors. The purpose of, I'm sorry, the purpose and character of the use including whether such uses is of a commercial nature or is it a non-profit educational purpose, uh, the nature of the copyright work, the, my, the amount and substantially of the portion of use in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole, as in, is it long or is it short in length, that is, are you copying the entire work 
as you might do with an image or just part of it like you might do with a novel and so forth. Uh, the effect of the use upon the market, I'm sorry, the effect of the use upon the potential market for or the value of the copyrighted work. Okay, so when I looked at the article and where is the article? Here we go. In which it was talking, and there's some remarks about the the court proceedings. So, one of the um, motions, let's say, the motion to include testimony from Christian Gossett, director of the Prelude to Axanar. Um, they questioned him and said, "This is the question: Do you think that Prelude to Axanar is infringes upon Star Trek's intellectual property?" Christian gave an answer saying yes. Next question, and in what way? The answer is, and that is an unlicensed film entertainment that uses countless elements of the Star Trek fictional world without, yeah, without, uh, without yeah, unlicensed. So, the, the next thing is that they counter with the fact that, and this is for the people for Axanar, um, that they're trying to look at this as a fair use thing, but it's not. And, and in this respect, um, because here I am, I'm talking about Axanar. And if I was to play a clip for that, even though there's an injunction against the producers from producing this any further, but if I'm talking about this and I play a clip from it, that's fair use. But in this case, Axanar like the other Star Trek fan, fan films, um, have really gone a, a different direction because I think of the whole Kickstarter campaign and the high production value. That's what's setting this series apart from any other fan film. And if you remember, uh, I also talked about that J.J. Abrams and, and Justin Lin had wanted to... Uh, talked about when Star Trek Beyond was coming out to tell CBS and Paramount, you know, to kind of back off because these are fans that are really supporting the whole series. The fact that it's lasted 50 years is because of fans like these. But again, we're looking at this being a much broader situation because of the whole money aspect. And Okay, well, XNR came up with the argument that, you know, Within the Star Trek universe, this whole idea of Axanar was from a Star Trek role-playing game that came out, I think, back in the um, 1980s. So there was a segment called The Four Years' War, and that was the, the Klingons and Federation war that was going on. So that's what this is, came all about. There is no book that I know of, re refresh my memory if there is, in the Star Trek books that have been produced anything about that, ser that situation there probably isn't so in this case they felt that they were within their limits to create such works and produce it whereas the fan films use sets that are reproduced use costumes that are reproduced and portray actors and who portray the aliens or other characters on that series so this is where's the balance in both i don't know other than because of this whole kickstart and the amount of money they generated to produce this that's the sticking point now if you're a star trek fan and you love the star trek books there was simon and schuster created a kind of like a writing competition in which you can write stories in which the best stories get collected into an anthology and the anthology gets produced. So the winner of that would get, I think, a contract a contract with them and get to write Star Trek books. If I'm one of the people of Axanar and I love making Star Trek movies then there has to be a, 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 a way to compensate CBS and Paramount. And I said, if they per allow Axanar to finish the damn movie, let it be produced, then distributed by CBS and Paramount, 
and then whatever profits come from that, even if it's not a complete 50-50 split, there has to be some kind of compensation towards them. So, um, so when, when I looked at the, the comment, and I hope that um, this person I'm referring to, I'm, I'm sorry, just give me one moment. So, um, on t- the, the person I'm going to refer to is Axel Monitor on Twitter. Uh, and when I proposed that, I'm not sure they're referring to the article or to my comment about the the whole split the profits when the movie is made. Uh, they wrote because copyright holders should re- because copyright holders should reward those who make money off intellectual properties they don't own. So again, I'm not too clear as refer to the article um, or to to my comments, but I just think that. Th- it doesn't qualify as fair use. We we can kind of uh, go along with that. Um, but on the other hand, neither are other the the fan films either. So you really kind of have to treat it both the same, or make an exception, and make it clear so that in the future that this doesn't happen. Because honestly, I enjoy the fan films. For a good reason. Because there are stories out there like me that want to see, well, what happened to that character? Or who did this in that situation that they talked about on a previous Star Trek episode? As part of like a small little nugget, but someone took that idea, that idea and just expand upon it. And they wanted to have a medium to express that. So we can do that in writing. I did fan fiction for a couple of years. I would love to see someone do that and not be held in litigation for violating copyright laws if they wanted to do a film of that. As long as they're not doing this to make a profit, and if so, then CBS and Paramount should be compensated for that. I, that's my two cents on that. So, enough of me ranting, enough of me going off on that. So, I'm going to end this podcast, and normally I don't give a telegraph of what I'm going to be planning on, but we're coming towards the end of the year. We have a month to go, but the next podcast, next week, I'm going to be talking about the DC four-hour crossover with Supergirl, The Flash, Arrow, and The Legends of Tomorrow. So once all four episodes are seen and dissected, I will do a podcast on that. The week after that, and that's going to start on December 5th, I'm going to do one last sci-fi news for the year. And then the week after that, December 12th, is going to be the exact same week as Star Wars Rogue One. So hopefully within a week after that, I will get... To watch that movie with Mr. Gene or Mr. Gene will watch it separately and like we did with The Force Awakens and we'll do our last podcast for the year. Now come January we will do the uh, year in review for 2016 and but I'm not sure how the date is that other than sometime in January like it did last year. So all right I'm exhausted from talking. I need to go get something to eat. So I'm really happy that this is all coming out um, in a great way to get all my anxiety about the past week or two with the election, to talk about something that is fun for me and exciting. And honestly, this is what drives me, is to do this kind of podcast. So you can follow follow me on the various social networks. You can... uh, email me. I'm sorry, I'm blanking out here. You can email me at the monster sci-fi show at gmail.com. Again, thank you to Tony. Thank you to Chris. And also thank you to that person on Twitter with the handle AXA monitor is A X a monitor. So thank you all for this great episode. And I'm hoping to get more input from all of you guys. Let me know what you think. Am I wrong? Am I right? Am I cute? Am I smart? Tell me more about my eyes. All right. Thank you very much for listening to the Monster Sci-Fi Show. Sci-Fi, from a certain point of view. Good night.
This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network, your station for all things geek, classic, current, and beyond. Be part of the crew at esonetwork.com.